Okay, thank you. Um, so this may be, I think it said behavior-driven development on the program. This is probably going to be a little bit misleading in that the last five minutes will include some behavior-driven development. But what I want to talk about is a little bit of putting some sort of thinking framework around testing. Uh, putting, putting a little bit of sort of a, a way of thinking about testing. Mostly stuff that you probably already know but have maybe not thought about it this way before. Um, and then leading into some other ways of thinking about this because it you know, challenged your assumptions a little bit. And then right at the end, a bit of code on to actually show what I'm talking about with behavior-driven development. Who, okay, quick audience survey. Who has some idea what I'm talking about with behavior-driven development or behavioral testing? Okay. Who would claim to have actually worked in this way on any project? Four and a half people, right. Good, the audience isn't an audience of experts. I can get by, I can fake this. Um, and, and kind of why I'm giving this is this is an area that people have not necessarily um, hit upon a lot. You sort of hear it in the streets and stuff like that, but maybe you, ha you haven't tried it and people aren't sure what it is. And I guess what I'll say up front, the one thing to take away from this talk is it's nothing scary, it's just a different way of thinking about things. Okay, so when we're writing tests, we've got a lot of different things. I mean, there's a lot of sort of variations. And if you haven't thought in your head about, you know, how complicated is it to really write tests? What choices do you have to make? And, and I don't care if you're writing tests up front before you write the code, or if you've written code and you're putting tests on it, or if someone else wrote the code and you're self-defensively writing tests because you just like to have a clue what's going on, or for whatever reason. I mean, the first decision is, what level do you actually test at? Imagine you've got the big bunch of software with no tests and you're trying to, some big application, you're trying to test it. Do you go all the way down this end of isolated tests in particular, you know, somehow try and write tests that all stick together, uh, or all just operate self-contained, or do you go all the way up the other end of you're trying to test the whole big thing? And, I mean, I guess we'd all know in, in practice, at various points you're doing things all along this line. Um, and there's trade-offs at every different point along this line too, because, for example, if you're, if you're further down this end on the isolated side, what, what are you actually testing? What is a unit in a unit test? Um, someone sort of explained to me a long time ago now, unit testing becomes a lot easier when you redefine customer to mean unit. And at, you know, maybe that's a little inconsiderate, but in the Web 2.0 era, that's, it's maybe not a, you know, it happens to be done. But at the same time, if you go down to the single function level, well, that can get a bit crazy. If we're trying to have no dependencies on external stuff, okay, we need to mock some things up or put some stubs in for various external services, and I'll talk about that in a minute. If we're going all the way down the other end at everything integrated, then you need to make sure that the bits you're integrating with are actually available, and unless your system is very, very self-contained, you're going to have some external dependencies that you don't have necessarily have control over. Most software, if you think about it, is connecting thing A to thing B, whatever thing A and thing B might be. Like, okay, maybe games or something are self-contained, but a lot of it is connecting two different services. And running time is along the whole thing there. What do you, you know, I've seen, I've seen unit, very isolated unit tests that run a lot slower than the integrated tests because there's so much setting up and tearing down of things that the, the overhead outweighs the, I'm not gonna say the benefits of the test, but the overhead outweighs the actual running of the test. So, you know, that's pretty hard. And, and again, most people know this. If you've done testing, you know there's those trade-offs somewhere along the line. And you try very hard. You, you've heard you should be down this end. It should all be isolated. And at some point, I'll oh, hang it. We're just going to get by and we'll clean it up later on. And you never do. Quick thing on mocks here. And I don't want to go into mocks different from stubs and things like this. But just some things to think about if you haven't done. A lot of people don't mock out all of their external services. By which I mean, imagine you've got something that is... I don't know, a web service that talks to, that sends email as part of the reaction to sign up or something. So you really need to replace the, you don't want to actually send email every time you run the tests. Um, so you probably need to replace the email service somehow. Maybe you've got a flag in there that just says, if I'm running the test, don't do email. Maybe you put in a little class that actually substitutes for e your email service. Maybe you actually have a dummy network service running that you tell it to your email provider. Mocks are essentially classes that act as the dummy service and, and fake it. A couple of different ways to do it, and they, uh, monkey patching and dependency injections. Um, and again, just most people hopefully know this, but just in case you don't, the monkey patching idea is 
because everything in Python is a you know, first class object, you can replace everything. So you can happily substitute for the socket object in the socket module with your own dummy socket thing that never ever connects to the network. It always just goes, yep, here's, a, here's something back and if you call write on it, I'll accept it. If you call read on it, I'll give you back what you expect. I mean, the difference between mocks and stubs is mocks are semi-intelligent. When you call them, they give you back what you expect rather than just swallowing everything. Um, it was called monkey patching. I mean, there's a whole history about it. Originally, way back in the day, it was called gorilla patching. Not as in gorillas the monkeys, but as in gorillas the jungle fighters, which sounded like gorilla, which became monkey, and it's all downhill from there. And the idea was meant to discourage people from doing this, and then, particularly in the Rails world, they started adopting it as the way to go, and it became a badge of honor. And so now, you know, we're a bit torn about whether monkey patching is good or bad. It can be fragile. Poking about under the covers in things, maybe not a good way to go but in testing land, something like this is a lifesaver. The other way of doing things, oh, and sorry, if you're doing, yes. If you've got mocks, the problem is you're, you're, you're stubbing out, you're substituting for some real world service here, like a mail, a mail delivering service, or maybe a database, or maybe a, a logging system or an alert system. It's actually kind of important that your mock imitates reality, which it probably does the first day you write it, and it probably doesn't six months later, because the thing you're stubbing out actually changed in some way. So you actually need a second layer of tests that tends to check that your mocks actually match reality. And a lot of people leave that out, and everyone's going, yes, it worked fine. Why doesn't it work when we release it into production? Because the mail client changed their API, or Google Maps changed their API, or whatever, right? So. Mocks come with an added maintenance burden here of you need, to, you need to actually check that you're mocking reality. Your test should work when you, when you deploy. Which brings us to the other point. There's sort of another axis here of how much infrastructure are you going to want to maintain as you're doing your tests? How much infrastructure do you want to build? Um, if, it, if it's very hard to set up your test because you need to have all this extra stuff pulled in just to avoid external dependencies. Maybe you want to have less infrastructure and go a bit more integrated. Or maybe you want to have, if even, even at the integrated end of this axis can involve a lot of infrastructure because now you have to go and clean up after yourself, like remove dummy entries from a real database or clean up a real memcache server or something. I used to work for a company where we had some tests that could, not, that could really only be done against the production system because the production system involved 100 million users and it was a little hard to simulate that. And we did have to go in and clean some stuff up, up the tests. And so if the tests failed, they raised an operational alert in one case, because the operators had to go in and really, really clean this up. Um, we didn't run those tests very often. They were sort of pre-release things, but it happens. Which also brings out, there's the extra sort of thing of how hard is it to maintain these tests as you're going along. Um, we've all worked on projects, particularly those who are working on large open source projects, where the amount of effort you have to put in just to keep the darn test running can be depressing. Um, different words might be used at different times, but it can, you know, it can take a lot of effort. I'm not going to work on that bug because although it's easy to fix, it's going to take me three hours to fix the darn test suite, or it's going to require a huge refactoring of everything. I mean, I know I've been put off doing certain things because the overhead of changing the test suite is too annoying. Um, and this is particularly a bit of a problem, I think, more in the Python world than in, for example, something like the Java world or even the C++ world, particularly the Java world where a lot of this algorithmic processes for testing came from. Um, some of this stuff was easier because automated refactoring is a little bit easier in strongly typed pre-declared languages like Java and C++ and things like that. It is possible in Python, but you can there's more edge cases floating around that your automatic refactoring tools can sometimes sabotage you. And they do it infrequently enough that you think, my tool is great, it's all helping me do this refactoring and change all these things, right up until it doesn't, and you're caught by surprise. And now you have an unexpected amount of overhead to, to have to fix here. Whoa, that nearly was exciting. Note to self, don't step back. Okay, I'm not going to cover every single testing strategy in the world here, but I just want to put what I'm about to lead into into some kind of context. And you know, for fun and fun and laughter, try and work out other testing strategies that I'm not mentioning here, perhaps. Hello. This is hardly anyone does this. Formal verification is there are there are actual languages for writing out your program that you can then run through a verifier and it proves that it's correct. 
And this is you know, very hard on many levels. For example, at the C, the C level, like using the C language, you need a compiler that's also been formally verified to actually compile your program correctly. You'd need, at the Python level, you'd need something to actually formally verify that the Python version you're using does the correct thing and so on. It's, it's almost not worth it. Unless, for example, you're sending you know, something to Mars or a man to the moon or something like that, at which point you might want to put a little bit more effort in. Release early, release often doesn't work with manned space missions, for example. Um, so there's maybe more effort goes into some level than what we need to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. The next level down that we all, we all start to encounter at some point is basically test everything you can think of. And this was certainly, go back to the 70s and 80s, this was the testing strategy for those who did it. You know, sit down, just write out the full list. And that feels a lot like formal verification, and then you realize formal verification is even worse than that in terms of how hard it is. So test everything you can think of is why someone plonks down a sort of yellow pages size document on your desk of these are all the test cases. The next one, we're starting somewhere between test everything and, and this one is probably where most projects aim to be, the kind of anti-regression test suite. We don't want to have regressions. Um, so for, we particularly go along with don't, no bug fix gets submitted without a test. Um, if someone notices a problem, or if someone maybe even notices that, oh, we could end up screwing this up in the future, let's write a test just to make sure it keeps working. You know, so it's kind of reactive rather than proactive, but it, it certainly means that you keep moving forwards, or at least you keep moving sideways. You don't retrace the, the ground you've, you've been along. Fortunately, a lot, of programs, a lot of projects call this a regression test suite, and I don't think you want to test for regressions happening. You want to actually test for regressions not happening. Um, that kind of bugs me a little bit. Test-driven development is, again, not, I mean, it's bleeding into all software development, but it particularly came out of the Java circles. Um, they reach, they invent a lot of tools to sort of help them out from the unfortunate choice of using Java. Um, and this isn't, I mean, test-driven development is thrown around a lot. I'm not sure it's completely understood by a lot of people. It's certainly very hard to do. Um, the idea is, before you write any code, or before you write the next piece of code, you're at stage X, write, you write a test that is going to test the next thing you write. And it might be a, a method on a class, or it might be a, um, a particular output verifying that or something like that. The idea is because you're, you have to add this new feature, this test should be failing. If you can write the test for the next feature and it passes, well, you don't have to write the next feature for a start, you're already done. But in theory, you know, the feature doesn't exist. So you write a test and it fails. Then you write the smallest amount of code possible, and that's the hard step, to make it pass. Um, so, and this, if you do it really, really fiddly, it's, it's kind of a silly process because your very first line of code is something like, okay, I should be able to create, imagine we've got a program to create mazes for a dungeon or something. You know, I should be able to create a maze object. So the minimal amount of code that does that is it just returns a, a maze instance class that has nothing in it. No methods, no nothing. The next test you write, which is I should be able to specify the size or something like that, well, that, you know, now you have to add more code. Again, this works very well in, in I mean, an advantage the Java people have and the, the C++ and the strongly, type, the strongly specified compile time typing crowd have is their automatic refactoring tools are certainly a bit better and that can become faster. But if you sit down and try and do strict test-driven development, it's a little bit painful. It's kind of interesting. It's a, something I'd recommend trying but it's not necessarily Nirvana. Um, and you just keep doing this over and over again. The nice thing is you do build up an awesome test suite by the end, and you know, you've got your regression, your anti-regression test suite right there. Even I do it. It is, however, not a, I mean, test-driven development is not about testing, as it turns out, which sounds, what? You're actually specifying what should be going on rather than verifying what should be, you know, verifying that all the code works properly. You're writing the test up front, you're saying this should happen. And then you're writing code to make sure it does happen. You're not necessarily verifying that, and then the test verifies that that keeps happening as time goes forward, but you're not verifying that what your boss or your manager or the mailing list or whatever asked you to do is actually happening in total. You're just, ver you're, you're, you're sort of specifying what the code should do. So there is a little bit of a backwards thing there. I mean, it's test-driven development, not testing-based development, if you like. Document-driven development um, is more of a Python-specific type of way of doing things. And it's not a completely insane way of thinking about things. You know, what do I want to, how do I want to do here? Well, Python's very amenable to 
just trying things out, right? The suck and see approach to development, which is it's definitely not called because that doesn't sound at all professional. But you know, opening up a prompt and just trying something out is a very logical way of doing Python. And whether you use doc tests or whether you just you know literally write mini programs to do something, essentially writing the documentation of how will someone, how do I envisage someone using this going forwards, is not a crazy way to develop software. If the documentation is in some way executable, which is where something like doc tests come in. Um, and even other styles of testing that I'll get to later on, it's all the better. Now you've got your, your sort of regression, regression proof code built into that. That doesn't seem to come up in many other languages. It, it comes up in Haskell circles, for example. There, it tends to be a, not a crazy way of doing that. It um, doesn't come up in things like C++, Java world. Behavior-driven development is what we're about to get to. So. Within that framework of we're trying, to, we're trying to test that what we've built stays working, actually does what we're hoping it does, um, and we want some way to focus our mind of how to do it. Because everyone knows you sit down, I've been asked to build this, and I have an empty file. Oh my gosh, where do I go from here? Admit it, everyone sat there for sort of 10 minutes going, if only I could type the first thing. I'll take a comment, that'll, that'll do, that'll get me started. So. How do we actually, you know, we tend to create software in fairly sensible ways, right? We have something we want to build. And I say specification, but I don't mean a formal document that someone maybe lays down at your, on your desk or that you've carefully thought out. I mean, at some point you have an idea of, I want to build this. And then you go round and round in circles a lot. Gee, you should have made those lines a bit thicker. But okay, there's arrows there. Where there's arrowheads, imagine there's lines between them. <laughs> you tend to go round and round in circles a lot on, you know, okay, build something, try it out, see if it works, rinse, wash, repeat, go back, realize the specification wasn't necessarily accurate or needs to be added to or whatever. Like this is every project you've ever built really works this way. I'm just trying to make it, make it nice and clear here. And the specification may exist, like I said, might be a quick set, it might be something in your head, who knows what, right? There's lots of, lots of different places. But at some point, you don't sit down and magically code spews forth from your fingers. It, you have some idea of what you're trying to build. And I'd encourage that, you know, there's some value in capturing this information. If it's just in your head, it's all very easy for the first week or month or so to happily code what you're thinking of. Now put that aside for three months because your life got in the way of your fun and come back and there's a lot of, you know, what was I thinking when going on, um, even in professional projects, particularly if there's like a big open source project or something where you're not the only person committing to the code repository. There's some value in capturing specification, but we all hate doing things twice and we all hate writing documents and it can be very hard reading somebody else's fractured English even when they claim to be a native English speaker. Um, so again, what can we do to make that a little bit easier? Well, if you think about it, a lot of, a lot of specifications come down to, you know, I want to do something, I'm, I'm, I have some role to play, I want to do something, and something should happen. So we can kind of capture that pretty easily. I mean, that's what use cases really are, if you think about it. They're often dressed up, there's often diagrams and so on, but at the, at the, the smallest level, that's what they turn out to be. And we'll get back to that sort of role very briefly. For example, you know, I'm creating a maze, I want to be able to say how big it is so that I, I can create a maze of that size. That's, you know, that's the type of level we're at. And so behavior-driven development is focusing on that type of idea of instead of thinking what is the next method I want to test or something like that, instead of going from the code back to the test, writing the test and then writing the code, which feels like you're bouncing, you're half writing the code in your head before you go to the next thing, think about what is the next most important behavior or feature this software should have. And what is and, and next most important often means the smaller. So you know, I want to allow users to sign up and receive email and tag their friends is not a feature. That's 17 features. But I want users to be able to sign up, for example, might be the next most important thing because they can't have friends or send email and so on before they've signed up. So you need to write something, you know, that's that's the idea behind instead of going, what is the next function I want to implement, what is the next feature or sp most important thing I want to do? Work out a way you can test that. And here again, behavior development allows you to sort of split across not just a method or a class, but whatever you need to test it and then implement it. So they switch around the use case thing to be a little bit more concretely testable. Given that something that we can set up, like this is set up your worldview of things, trigger some event, like again, think your test is going to not just say if this happens, then this should happen. You want your test to be reasonably deterministic 
So you force it to happen and check that the outcome happens, which if we put it side by side with use cases makes, you know, it's exactly the same thing, except the, the item on the right is a lot more testable, concretely testable than the sort of fuzzy wuzzy on the left. At the, without being a vastly different language so that anyone can still read this. You know, anyone who's not a programmer, like you know, project manager or CEO, anyone could read the thing on the right and understand it. So what does this look like in practice? And uh, let me just pause here for a minute and say, and by pause here I mean move forwards, and say <laughs> the next, like a lot of what I'm talking about here, it's not the silver bullet, this annoying man keeps holding up signs saying I'm running out of time. Um, it's not a silver bullet, it's not a sort of magical concept that you've never heard of before or that is, you know, maybe it changes your life, but it, maybe it's not, you know, this isn't something amazingly difficult. What I'm talking about here is a different way of thinking about things. That to some extent we have rum, wrapped some nomenclature around, but it's also what I want to put into your head today as you go out of here is, you know, there's a different way of thinking about things as think about them as individual features or specifications rather than perhaps methods on classes or classes or so on. And so to this extent we sort of twist the language a little bit because if we're all stuck using the same language all the time, you don't, you get stuck in that rut of this is what the language can do. This actually has a name, um, sapir whorf hypothesis, that basically says the language we use sort of shapes the way we, we actually think about things. Um, and I don't mean if you speak Italian versus you speak English, you, you think differently, and maybe you do, but you know, if, you're, if you're talking about science in one language versus another, perhaps you get you know, one particular vocabulary versus another, you get things in a different way. So we're going to see a little bit of that here. Python's unit test module. Everyone kind of knows how this works, right? You create test case subclasses, you write methods called test something um, that do testing, assert things, assert things are equal to other things, and then you run the unit test, Python minus M unit test, and away you go. By the way, I'm sort of implicitly talking about unit test in Python 2.7 and 3.2 here. It's called unit test 2 if you're in versions before Python 2.7. So you know, it's very well worth, if you're using unit test and you're stuck on earlier Pythons, use unit test 2, which is on PyPy, which is a backwards porting of the unit test that is in 2.7. It's not at all confusing, really, I think. So this is what you know, a standard unit test looks like. This is from you know, actual code. I didn't write these names. But if you just look at the names, what on earth are these tests doing? Test field name does something, I guess, testing a field name, but I don't know what it's testing. If that fails, I wouldn't be able to necessarily tell you what it was meant to do. I certainly don't know what show hidden initial is meant to be telling me. Is it meant to be hidden or showing? Um, it's not really at all clear. I could rename these and split them up into classes so that it becomes a lot clearer from the titles. So okay, fields should allow their name to be overridden um, and choice fields should permit initial values in hidden. That, that second one is actually what the show hidden fields is testing. And it's clear from the context of the class as well as from the test name what should be going on. So if that fails and you see that test failed, choice fields dot should permit initial values in hidden widgets to fail, now you know what's wrong and what should be happening. And there's some value there. In behavior driven tests, you tend to try and write in things like that that work in sentences so that um, you know, it, it is immediately clear. It also, again, forces your mind to think a bit about how do I do this as sentences. You do need to, if, you, if you're doing this type of thing, because they don't start with the word test, you do need to sort of override the load test methods in unit test a bit to say, you know, to tell it to um, load things that start with the word should instead of the word test. This is not hard, it's a bit more code that fits on a slide to do it generically, so left as an exercise to the reader, but it really isn't that hard. You know, that's, that's, that should be enough information to get you there. Convince yourself, Malcolm said it's not that hard. You do end up creating a few more classes than you might with typical unit test stuff because you want it to read like sentences, so you tend to have a, a class per little concept. That's not a problem, you know, classes are reasonably free. The indentation in, in Python makes it clear where a class starts and where it doesn't. Again, files are even pretty free in a test directory. People are, pack a lot into unit test classes. Something that annoys me. The, setting up the context, like, you know, given that some world context, that's the setup method in unit tests, it's not that, it's not that hard. Everything else in unit test pretty much just works, it, but it, just relabeling the titles gives you a nice behavioral feel to things and makes it fairly clear. Doc tests. This is a way, I mean, doc tests have a good and a bad reputation, and I'm very much on the, 
it's easier to use them badly than it is to use them well, but there are cases where it works well. If you can write your test as a nice little narrative, and okay, I stole things from the Dick and Jane books here if they had forced on me when I was young, but you can write you know, reasonably clear narrative style testing of what's going on. Where these things tend to fall down is if the setup is not, if there's a lot of, a lot of setup required to make something work. You know, if the context, the world context needs to be stubbed out a lot, doc tests probably aren't the way to go. They're also, if things change a lot, they're very hard to edit in place because when you, you can only run all of a doc test, you can't run just part of it. And this makes it hard to say, okay, just run it from halfway through. So you can spend a lot of time going, run the doc test file. Oh, it failed, fix line three. Run it again. Oh, it failed, fix line five. Run it again, it failed, fix line seven. You'd really just like to you know, fix particular bits. So if you've got large amounts of setup, it's worth. If you can, but if you can write a you know, reasonable narrative, this can become a nice captured specification that is executable. Um, that being said, Ian Bicking, who's a big Chicago-based Python developer, very good software developer, he wrote a um, blog post last year, I think, or maybe 2009, on how he thought behavioral driven development was just doc tests in Python. And I would say I fairly strongly disagree with his claims there because as you get deep, he, the particular examples he used work well, but as you get deeper into trying to test more complicated pieces of software, the whole doc test overhead goes right off the rails and I think it would become far more effort than it was worth. So if you, know, you hunt out his blog post and read it, think it works up to a point at the point you're starting to fight with the doc test, it's definitely worth moving on to you know, unit test or this next one that I'll just talk about, which are um, sorry, domain specific language sort of modules that bring a little bit more language, bring a little bit more flavor to this. I'm not a huge fan of domain specific languages because it feels like I'm already programming in Python. Why should I have to learn yet another language for something? But if I'm doing this a lot, then knowing the language, it would make sense. There are a couple of different reasonable ones here. Lettuce and Freshen, both of which are rewrites of a Ruby tool called Cucumber. Um, a similar thing exists in JavaScript world called Jasmine. So we seem to be naming things biologically in this, in this particular field. I'm not sure where Freshen, how they got from Cucumber to Freshen, but that's the way it goes. Um, both of these are reasonable. Both of them are roughly equivalent. I'll just give you a sort of quick example of what Freshen looks like. A test literally looks like this. Like, I mean, this is executable test code in Freshen. You write it in a test file. Um, the indentation doesn't particularly matter, but they do tend to use it so that it's easy to scan. Scenario is a, scenario is a reasonably key word here, um, telling it, you know, this is a test case. This is a particular thing we're testing. Given and when and then, all of the first, all the first words here are all special to the, the module, um, saying, you know, given me, and we'll see, okay, so what does this look like in actual code, is we write particular code to say, okay, before is something you set up before all the test is run. Here are some, here is the line, you know, a given line will match this, and it's using regular expressions, so I can enter any number I like into the test, into the calculator, and that is what we execute to do this. SCC here is a, a global that Freshen has floating around that is the context. Um, Similarly, we can do whens and thens, um, and they match things, and we can read things out of this SCC global context that's floating around that is set up new for every test. So effectively, you're, you're writing, if I go back to this original thing, you're writing a, a bunch of functions that when the test runner parses, it says, okay, given a string that should match against a method name, perhaps with a regular expression in it, and which it says, okay, match against another given thing that perhaps with a regular expression, and then there's things that are given the when decorator that should also be tested and so on. My slight complaint with this is it's, it reads very well, but if you're running lots of different tests, you end up writing about a billion of these methods to match each of the different ways you want to phrase this. So if you're doing lots of repetitive tests, it's nice. If you're not, it can get really painful. Again, I've sat down and done a couple of not completely toy projects in this way just to see what it's like. And you had to take sharp objects away from me on one of them by the end. It was getting very frustrating writing all these test methods. Um, the nice thing is, though, it does allow this sort of templated approach to things because you've got a lot of tests that basically do the same thing. Again, this is executable code in Freshen. And this is where Freshen does it, and I don't think Lettuce does quite this way yet. Anything in angle brackets is automatically interpreted to be a label in the examples table down the bottom. So without that previous you know, page of code, which was two slides, actually just runs all of these tests all at once. 
And you could very easily see having a spreadsheet of cases like this that maybe product managers manage or something that is then turned into code and executed. So, I mean, I just want to put that in your head. It, it, again, I would encourage people to try this out and see if it works for you or if it doesn't. I can see this working for me on certain types of projects. I'm not 100% confident I would be able to predict ahead of time if it worked for me or not. But I definitely like, for example, the unit test way of labeling things with should rather than test because it forces you to actually question X should do blah, blah, blah. Well, question yourself, should it really? Is that correct? Think about those who work on open source projects. Think about, for example, how often have you seen a patch that deletes a test? People are very, very afraid to delete tests by questioning if it actually has a right to keep testing that thing. Um, like, you know, there's a lot of bugs that come around where at some point someone goes, you know, oops, maybe we're actually enforcing the wrong behavior there. I've written certainly tests that enforce the, right, the wrong behavior and people have worked around them for ages before someone stepped in and said, you know, actually the test is wrong. Try it out. Think about, you know, is this, is this really, you know, is, I, a lot of this is, you know, get your brain out of the, the, the current habit, just try something new, you know, expand your mind a little bit. Particularly the last one is a big benefit I found is, you know, can you come back in six months time and when your tests fail, understand what was this test meant to do in the first place? It's not enough to know it failed, it's enough to know, you know, what do I have to fix without having to reverse engineer the tests. I can think of one big project I'm involved with with Russell where I spent a lot of time reverse engineering the test to find out what the behavior was meant to be. <laughs> These slides, of which I know there are a lot of them, are actually up on GitHub if people want to pull them down or talk to me or mail, whatever. I've gone fractionally over and haven't been shot. So quickly, <laughs> questions, anybody? A couple of quick questions. Chris? We're pushing up against the keynote, so we can't drink now. So, um, I heard in another conference that Cucumber was like the, the, the best PD framework. Do you, what, what do you think? I mean, you present freshman and it Lettuce. looks appealing. So cu cu cucumber is the, is the Ruby, is yeah, the Ruby versions. And, and both Freshen and Lettuce are pretty much direct copies of Cucumber moved over to the Python world. Um, Jasmine is a similar copy of Cucumber moved over to the JavaScript world. Um, I think they're okay. Like, you know, it, like I said, my, my, I have a slight complaint with the domain-specific language approach. It gets a little bit crazy, but... So, so Freshness may be the, 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 the first attempt to, to try BDD for Python developers? Freshen and Lettuce. I think Lettuce is slightly older, but Freshen is a little bit better maintained. Okay. One more? Or Any we're more really quick questions? Nope. Everyone with really detailed questions can catch Malcolm later. Yeah, I'll be around. <laughs> very good. Well, thank you very much, Malcolm. And uh, someone's left theirs here.